we we loved this series actually i don't know about you but i loved this series running with giants we start off this series on the basis of hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 which says therefore since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses the the words the author of hebrews uh, when he starts challenging the people to whom he is writing and of course it to all of us um he is trying to remind us of the kind of people we are surrounded by therefore since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses there are so many people who have gone ahead in their walk of faith and lived their lives to accomplish god's purpose through their lives and finished well now they are sitting in this beautiful arena around us and watching over us cheering us on as we run our race in this world that's why um uh, we we wanted to learn something out of these giants of faith who finished their race ahead of us he discusses them in chapter 11 and says hey they, these are the kind of people you want to look up to people like abel noah people like abraham moses um isaac and jacob and and um you know samson and sarah and all the prophets he goes on listing them it's not an exhaustive list it's a small list but it's a, it's a wonderful list so the series was born out of this question hey if we have an opportunity to have a conversation with any one of them that are watching over our lives and cheering us on and ask them if there is one thing that you can teach us out of your life that we can learn and apply for our own personal faith walk what would that be that was the question by which and on on the basis of which um we we wanted to do this series what a journey it has been for the last 3 weeks and today we are in the last day of running with giants we looked at samson's life because samson was a curious character he should not have been in the list of faith heroes because he there's nothing that he exhibited that showed faith in him in his life he is not even a guy with a good character he lived his life as as an immoral person and yet he finds his his name in the list of faith heroes so we asked him the question hey um now that you ended up in the faith heroes the hall of fame what would you teach us and week 1 we saw he would tell us you don't have to lose your eyes in order to be blind you don't have to be you don't have to lose your eyes in order to be blind because that's how samson lived his life he has eyes but he was always blind he was blind to the purpose of god he was blind to the power of god in his life he was blind to the um, power of relationships in his life and because he was blind to all these things he lived his life in such a way that brought um, you know shame on the name of god that he ended up finding himself as really a blind man as uh, ended up in this uh, in the, as a prisoner of philistines with his eyes gouged out so this blind eyes gouged out samson would look at you and me and say you see you don't have to lose your eyes in order to be blind i was already blind even if i had eyes so he would teach us um you know you really need to learn to look at your life from god's perspective and begin to live your life for his purpose we looked at sarah another curious character she shouldn't have been there i understand abraham the father of faith being in the list of uh, faith heroes but i mean what is he what is she doing there she was the one person who actually loved right loved the way she loved it was not with joy love when god told her next year you're going to have a child she loved mockingly a mocking god but here she finds her there in the list of faith heroes so we ask her uh, said i mean how come how come you ended up in this list uh, what would you teach us and sera would look at us and say um, you know this is one lesson that i've learned that is this that don't complicate god's promises with your solutions if god promised something to you he is responsible to finish the promise that he fulfill the promise that he gave you if god started the work inside you he is the one who's going to finish it you try to find your own solutions for god's promises you'll mess it up and sarah did that 
the mess that she created, we are still experiencing the results of that, even today. The world is in chaos today because of one woman who just couldn't wait for God to finish what he began in their lives. One woman who decided, well, let me get ahead of God's time. And then we're all still struggling right now. That's Sarah. So she would look at us and say, don't mess it up. Don't mess it up by coming up with your own solutions to God's promises. So we learned from her. Last week, we looked at um, one of the greatest prophets that has ever lived on the earth, Elisha. And we ask Elisha because Elisha comes from the shadows of one of the, well, the greatest prophet who ever lived on the earth, which is Elijah. Elisha comes from the shadows of this great prophet. He lived in the shadows for the most, most part of his life. He moved away from a comfortable life to become a servant um, and lived, a, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 for an un unforeseen time he had to be uh, as a servant to Elijah. Being a servant to a prophet is one of the worst things to happen to you. I mean, it's not a good thing to, you know. But he lived as a servant to Elijah after leaving a very good, well-running business, well-farming. He gave up his business. He gave up his job. He gave us his employment. Uh, he gave up all his investments, all his savings. He just, you know, go, went broke and then joined Elijah as a servant, giving up all the comforts and becoming a servant, following Elijah for an indefinite time. And yet, because of his faithfulness, God honored him, and he became a prophet with a double portion of the anointing that was on Elijah. Uh, that if Elijah, I told you, if Elijah did 14 miracles, 14 recorded miracles in the Bible, Elisha did 28 miracles, recorded miracles. Actually, if you look at the entire Bible, he was the second highest miracle performing guy apart from Jesus. I mean, after Jesus, he was the only guy who did more miracles. Well, recorded miracles at least. So, Elijah, Elisha would tell us, if we ask him, what would you teach us? He would tell us, be faithful wherever you are right now. In your obscurity, be faithful. In small things, be faithful. Because God, for God, it's not how big you have done, how excellent you are in everything. For God, it's more important that you are faithful in small things. Faithful in l l obscurity. When nobody's watching you, nobody cares about you, nobody's paying attention to you, you stay faithful. If you are faithful in small things, then you are eligible to have bigger things in your life. That's the principle by which God works. That's God's economy. And so Elisha would tell us, be faithful wherever God placed you today. Today, we're going to look at another interesting character. Another one who shouldn't have been in the list. But he finds himself in the list. The guy, the angry, prone, all the time sulking and really, really, really bitter guy but a prophet nonetheless. But ended up on the list of faith heroes. His name is Jonah. This is one guy who is like all the pastors in this world. He hates his job. He hates what he has to say. No, I don't, I hate, I don't hate my job, by the way. I love you guys. Uh, he hated his job. He hated the message that God wanted him to give to people. And yet he finds himself in the list of faith heroes. All the prophets includes Jonah too. Um, the, the, you know, the interesting story of Jonah can teach us a lot of things. And I don't want to get ahead of uh, the message today uh, to share about Jonah and, his, and what we can learn from Jonah's life. I have a team coming up onto the stage and bring the word to, to all of us, including me today. And I'm super excited to listen to them today. Um, one person I can't live without, and I, you know, without her, I obviously cannot do anything in this world, and I'm glad she's going to talk to us and teach us today. Pastor Janet, put your hands together. Welcome to Pastor Janet onto the stage. Come on. A little louder. You should do better than that. 
She's going to be joined by our campus pastor, another campus pastor um, in Narsingi, Pastor Nani, who is, um, who is a brilliant leader, by the way, in his own making, and he's a brilliant preacher. You get to know him right now. Put your hands together. Welcome Pastor Nani on stage. Come on, a little louder. You should do that. The stage is yours. Oh, that was a very, you can just fill in the blanks kind of an introduction. All right, uh, let's go to the sermon. Uh, uh, the character that has been introduced uh, this morning is Jonah. Now, if you, um, I'm sure all of us have gone to the Sunday school, I'm taking it for granted. But people who have just uh, having a walk with the Lord and just got to know Jesus uh, from another faith, let me tell you, Jonah is a, a story that kids love. They enjoy because it's, it's not about the Jonah, but it's about that city. In a way, it's about the storm. It's about the wreck. It's about the whale. It's almost like a cartoon. So that's where the story is. But um, I would like to tell you a story about Jonah. Most of you know what uh, the story of Jonah is, but I still would want you to be with me, walk with me, and um, let me go ahead and brief you what the life uh, story of Jonah is. Uh, because from after the story, we would like to know uh, how can we recover from what Jonah did and how can we safeguard ourselves also from the lessons that we could pick up from what Jonah did. Now, a man being swallowed whole by a large fish, difficult to imagine, it happens only in the cartoons, and then pray to God while being in the belly of this humongous creature for thir three days. Still not believable. I do understand it sounds like a fairy tale, but it's not. It is a story that happened unless you read the story from the book of Jonah in the Bible. Now, interestingly, the book of Jonah con consists of only four chapters. It's, it has about uh, 48 verses and maybe close to about 1,300 words in the entire book of uh, Jonah. And you can read this story in about max to max 15 to 20 minutes. Beautifully balanced, deep and profound, Jonah's adventure opens a window into God's heart. Now, the book of Jonah is different from the other minor prophets because it's a personal experience of the prophet himself. The story is presented much like of the person that we discussed last week, Elijah and Elisha. Though the book contains no direct prophecy, the experience of Jonah is in itself a real reflection of God's message. Now, Jonah was, a God, was God called, God commissioned man with God given message. His sphere of service was specific to his call. He was to go to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, and these Assyrians were fierce enemies of the Israelites. Now, Jonah tried to resign his commission and take a cruise to the Mediterranean. Now, he paid for the fare, he took the passage on the ship, and he was ready to set on sail to Tarshish. But the same Lord from whom he was fleeing was preparing a great wind, which we can, we can call him as Tom, to bring him to obedience. Now God's prophet, our lovely Jonah, was sleeping the sleep of self-complacency while the other sailors, if I can put it as the pagan sailors or the heathen sailors were about to perish. Now, what were they doing? They were praying to their gods while Jonah was not even praying. He was just sleeping. Now, when he was awakened, it took a series of humiliating questions from the sailors to get him confess why the storm was happening. And finally, Jonah was cast into the sea there a great fish was lying in wait, and the Lord had prepared this great huge creature to swallow our dear Jonah. 
For three days and three nights, Jonah was in the belly of the fish. There he began to pray. Had he had prayed instead of fleeing from God, I'm sure he would not be in the belly of the fish. Nevertheless, his prayer was real. It had con conviction and confession and intercession and all those things. And in his prayers, if you look at it, if you read, uh, if you read uh, chapter 2, you can see that he, t he also prays uh, prayers just like as similar to Psalms. And in spite of all his prayers and pledges and wolves, he was not delivered until. It's the same story. I'm just giving you a pause. Until Jonah confessed the salvation is of the Lord and the God caused the fish to vomit or cast him off on the dry land. Now, although Jonah had gone through a traumatic experience had, and he had, um, you know, he had reaffirmed his faith in God, he still needed to fulfill Lord's commission that was given to him. The Lord again. If you read verses, chapter 3, verses 2. The Lord said again, arise. I would just want to hold on there for a moment. God gave him a work to do. He was supposed to go there and do it, but he didn't do it. But God comes back to him again in spite of him making a choice that's not great. He came back to him again. And he said, Arise, go unto Nineveh, the great city, and preach unto it, preach unto the preaching that I told you. And this time Jonah did not hesitate. He, the, because I believe he understood the consequences of his previous experience, and he had become much obedient. He was now a God-called man with a God-given message and a God-directed mission. Now, Jonah delivered a message of repentance to that city called Nineveh, which was some uh, uh, 20 miles long and 12 miles in, uh, uh, you know, 12 miles uh, the whole city was. And this is what he said. As the Lord directed him, he went and told Nineveh that they have to repent. Uh, yet in 40 days, otherwise Nineveh will be overthrown. And all that he did according to what God had told him. God didn't have to give him another chance. Did he? I don't know about you. I still wonder why he is where he is in the heroes of faith. He was called by God to do his job. But that in he didn't do what he was called to do. But then, here, the verse says, the, God, the Lord said to him, arise. That means God came back to him the second time. God always, always gives us a second chance. Even when you have made bad choices, even when it's the worst choice that you think you have made, God always gives us a second chance. Now, if I go back to Jonah... Like how Pastor Jess said, if I go back to Jonah and ask Jonah, what are the words of encouragement would you give me to teach from your life of getting a second chance from the God Almighty? How do I recover just like you from the bad choices you made? And I think this is what he would say. Take responsibility for your bad choice. Take responsibility for your bad choice. Usually, generally, we always say it is he, it is him, it is them, it is they, it is, it is a situation, it's a weather, it's a thing, it's a material thing, it's, 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 it's something but it's not me. My choice is bad not because of me. My choice is bad because of my situation or because of the people or because of... Classic example I will give you. Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve sinned, they hid from God. 
they kept blaming when God asked them. Oh, I think she's the one who actually sent me there. Or it is me. Actually, I want to just have a bite. Or whatever it is. It's a classic example of how we push the blame on the others. So take responsibilities of the choice, the bad choice, or the incorrect choice that you have made. No matter what, no matter how much the situations have played in, people have played in, circumstances have played in, weather has played in, doesn't matter. Take responsibility. Stand up for the choices you made. Jonah 112. Jonah realized the storm was hitting them that bad because Jonah knew it was him. Because that's what it says, chapter 1, verses 12. Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm because I know that is my fault and that the great storm has come upon you. Just a little bit of deviation here because I just want to tell you on the journey, on the way, on the way of your bad choices, he doesn't leave anybody around. Not Jonah, but God. It's easy to get sucked in and locked into the, lost in the story of Jonah because Jonah running away from God, the storm, the big fish, and the, uh, you know, the, the, the hard trek into the Nineveh. You, you can think of all these things that the story talks about. But I believe the story is just not about Jonah and Nineveh. We'll come back to Jonah though, but I just want to I, I think you should, we should see this as well. Now, on the boat, that, that ship was getting trashed by the storm, and, and there was a terror struck between the crew and the sailors and every people that were on the boat. But there are a few things that the verses, the Bible tells us about these people who were on the boat. Now, they say that they, verses 5, they said that they believed in many gods. The sailors that were also along with Jonah on the same ship says that they believed many gods. I'm just holding my point. I'm coming there. Hold on. Now they said, for they do try to avoid throwing because they did everything under the sun. They put lots to figure out from where is the storm coming. And it was none of them. And they figured out it was this, our, our, our dear Jonah who's sleeping in the attic who's, uh, who's the guy. And these poor sailors who were so terrified prayed to every God that they knew that could hold off the storm. But here's the beauty of the sailors and God and the storm. They might have, be be they might have believed in many gods. And it might have been Jonah's rebellion that brought the storm in the first place. But between the violent tempest and the immediate calm when Jonah hit the waves, the crew experienced the mighty hand of the one true God. They were overcome with holy awe. Because verse 16 says this, so much so they offered up sacrifices and made vows to God. It's the same wind and the waves that are consequences of Jonah's disobedience. The same wind and the waves that God uses to introduce himself as the Lord Jehovah to the sailors who didn't know the true God. That's beautiful. Just not about Jonah and the fish and the city, but in between there is something that he's watching and doing everything for everybody. Maybe it was a first chance for them. But it was a second chance for Jonah. Proverbs 28, 13 says so wonderfully, so wonderfully, a man who refuses to admit his mistake can never be successful. But if he confesses and forsakes them, he gets another chance. That's what he did. The whale did not vomit until Jonah realized what he did. Only then 
it was vomited back to the land because it's beautifully said. And take risks. So you need to take responsibility of the bad choices you make. And the second point that uh, Jonah would suggest us to record from the bad choices is, would be this. You can write it down in the notes that is given to you. Um, repent and turn away from the bad choice you made. Repent and turn away from the bad choice you made. We already read the scripture portion from Jonah. Chapter 2, there you can clearly understand Jonah was in the belly of this fish and started praying to God. It's a prayer of repentance. In Jonah chapter 2, verses 9, turn your Bibles to Jonah chapter 2, verses 9. It says like this, after praying a long prayer like this, he actually ends up his prayer uh, and telling like this, what I have vowed, I'll make good. He's telling to God, God, <clears throat> I, I, I did make a uh, bad choice. Now, please forgive me. So God, uh, and please forgive me. And he, he, wrote, he, he actually prayed this prayer. And so Jonah would tell to us like this, repent and turn away from the bad choice. As believers, as Christians also, we all know that the first step towards eternity is repentance. Or first step uh, for salvation is repentance. If you look at the Mark Gospel, it has 16 chapters and it's action-packed. Whenever you are in travel and you want to read that uh, the Jesus story completely, you can actually read the Mark Gospel. In the Mark Gospel, chapter 1, wherein the author talks about uh, Jesus' uh, um, baptism and his preaching as well. Let us try to look at the first words that Jesus taught in Mark Gospel, chapter 1. Turn your Bibles to Mark Gospel, chapter 1, verses 15. It tells like this. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near repent and believe the good news repent and believe you, you can see that right so first step always comes is repentance even the author of hebrews apostle paul peter everybody in the first century they stressed or focused more on the repentance and then followed by faith so what happens in in, in today's christendom this is what happening particularly the believers who are born and brought up in a christian family we always teach our kids to have faith in jesus have faith in jesus but we are actually forgetting repentance if you forget that what happens you know over a period of time when he really faces real struggles in life after he gets older or bigger that is when he'll he'll face real crisis because he he, he never knew about the first step that is repentance of course, some of you might be thinking, brother, I know I repent every day. But chances are there, some of us might be feeling sorry and feeling that we are actually regretting or thinking that we are regretting. There is a lot of difference between feeling sorry or feeling regret and repentance. So uh, the, the classic example in the Bible is Paul, uh, sorry, Saul and David. If you, you all know about the story of David, right? But if you look at David, uh, the, the kind of sin that he committed with Bathsheba is bhayankar. You know, if you look at the scripture portion, when this prophet Nathan confronted David with this sin, uh, told that, okay, this is what the scripture portion talks about. See, it's very interesting. I want you to turn your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 13. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 13. Prophet Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. So scripture portion is clearly telling that, hey, God has already forgiven your sin. On the other hand, if you look at Saul's life, okay, Saul is the first king of Israel, and God actually commanded him to go and kill all what is living in, uh, in uh, I mean, Amalekites, okay, go and kill all the Amalekites. So if you put these goggles, like uh, worldly goggles, if you look, and through the goggles, if you try to look the intentions of Saul, you feel like, yes, what Saul did is right. Because I know one of my mama um, who actually takes bribe and he actually uh, justifies it by telling that, hey, I support another poor kid. Same thing. If I put the same worldly glasses, I can clearly understand Saul is also thinking the same. Say, I brought all the best things that are there in the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, in, in Amalekites and actually wanted to give this burnt offering to our Lord. So if you put these goggles, it looks good. Okay, we, we, if, if we actually evaluate the sin, we think that, okay, it is lower level of sin. And the sin, the kind of sin that David committed is, is uh, humongous. But on the other hand, if you look at the scripture portion, God forgave David. But God rejected Saul as king. You know why? The, you know the reason why it had happened? It's all because 
David is a repented man. On the other hand, Saul is a sorry man. So the difference between a repented man and a sorry man is this. The sorry man keeps on doing the same mistake again and again, again and again, again and again. But the repented man, once he knows that he committed sin against God, he'll leave it and turn away from there. You know, um, David actually wrote this psalm, Psalm 51. You know, if you read the scripture portion, you should read it. Now you, now you know that, that, okay, Nathan after confronting, um, Prophet Nathan confronting David, David and this agony or repentance, he actually wrote this psalm. If you read it, it will tell like this. It, it speaks like this. Uh, David writes like this. God, if you want to hit me, hit me. God, if you want to kick me, kick me. It's okay. But don't let your presence leave me. Don't let the Holy Spirit leave me. So it's okay to face the consequences. So a repented man is okay to face the consequences, but he don't want to leave God's presence from him. But on the other hand, sorry man uh, is like, God, uh, I'm sorry. God, today I came late to worship. I'm sorry. Again, he'll be, come, come late. I mean, again, he repeat the same mistake again and again, again and again, again and again. So repentance involves the total change in your entire personality, your will, your emotions, um, your thinking. So turn your Bibles to Luke Gospel chapter 15, verses 7. It, it, it tells like this, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. When, when, when we read the scripture portion like this, we think that, hey, yes, I belong to that 99 group of righteous people. I don't need repentance. Nope. You know, it's not like that. Zach Punen, he actually interprets the scripture portion and tells like this, hey, these 99 people whose scripture portion is talking about who doesn't need repentance because they repentant, they repent every day. They do their daily devotions every day. Holy Spirit shed the light in the areas wherein they are still away from Jesus. And they'll confess their sin and they'll repent and they renew in their spirit. So they don't need repentance. So as believers, we need to actually make a habit of asking God to show the areas wherein we are still against Jesus and repent on a daily basis. When you repent on a daily basis, you don't have to repent like these righteous people, 19 and righteous people. Particularly when we make the boy, uh, bad choices or wrong choices, we are supposed to repent and turn away. Okay? And, and then, see, if you look at the life of Jonah, the moment he repented, the moment he repented, this is what happened. Jonah, chapter 3, verses 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. See, the moment he repented, God talked to him. Probably you might be thinking that, hey, I committed that sin. Or, or, or you might be thinking that God is not answering my calls. I have been praying this prayer for so many years. Probably the chances are that you are a sorry man or, a, or just regret, regretting, but you're not a repented person. Maybe you should repent. This is the time that you should repent so that God will answer your prayers. Like how God actually spoke second time to Jonah. So third point that Jonah would tell to us to record from the bad choices would be this embrace God's grace. You can write it down in the notes that is given. Embrace God's grace. So particularly the people who make these bad choices um, and they repent and then involving in the ministry or coming closer to God or having a constant and consistent walk with God, they'll, they'll struggle. This phase from repentance to embracing God's grace, there will, there will be some struggle in their hearts all the time that am I worthy? Or my past, my past is bad. So this is what happened in the life of John Newton. In 17th century, at, at the age of 11, he started going to voyages, okay? The point in time, I think, yes, we don't have flights at the point in time, right? I think the first flight is 1908, August 8th, if I'm not wrong. So uh, uh, at the point in time, the mode of transportation is only ship, and he used to go to voyages with his father. His father was a captain for a ship. And his father used to do this business, uh, slave business, or slave trader, okay? He used to take people as captives and from Africa and used to sell to the people in the Europe, okay? And uh, uh, he, he led a very bad life, this John Newton. He used to drink a lot. He did all the nasty things on the ship and to the slaves. Very bad life. And one day what happened when he is taking this huge number of uh, uh, slaves, uh, to sell uh, to, to, to somebody in Ireland, okay? At the point in time, he was stuck in this horrendous storm. 
And uh, that is when he knelt down and asked God, Jesus, uh, please help me and save me from this horrendous storm. And miraculously, God helped him, not only him, the entire ship and all the slaves got saved. That is when he started after, after getting down uh, to the shore and he, he went and purchased the Bible and started reading the scripture portion. And he find it really difficult for him, even though he repented, uh, for him to come to Christ or uh, to, to be like, uh, have a constant and consistent work. His past always used to haunt him, telling that, hey, you're a bad person. You did all those bad things on the ship. You repented, I know, but still I think you're not deserved to do Lord's work or you are not deserved to actually stand in his presence. These things actually bothered him until he embraced the God's grace and understood his grace. That is when he went ahead and wrote the song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet Thou Art. Uh, I, I mean, singers, worship leaders, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound that Saved a Wretch Like Me. He knows that he is a wretch. So he moved that phase from, from the phase from repentance and embraced God's grace. So, so particularly when you are in this phase like struggling, thinking that my past is so bad, remember, don't let bad choices disqualify you. Do not let bad choices define you. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, verses 1. It tells like this, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Chances are that we, we, some of us may be carrying this emotional baggage or spiritual baggage, thinking that I'm a bad person, I have bad past. But remember, when you repent and turn away from that sin, enjoy, you'll enjoy the grace of God. Yes, your past is bad. That doesn't mean God is not going to use you. So do not let bad choices define you. And second thing, do not let bad choices disqualify you. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, verses 28. It tells like this, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. In the sight of God, Jonah is still a prophet, okay? I, God knows that Jonah didn't like Nineveh, that doesn't mean Jonah won't become a, uh, is no more a prophet anymore. God still uses him because in his side is still a prophet and in his side, uh, God, in God's side, Jonah is still qualified. God became mentor for Jonah. So don't let your bad choices disqualify you. I wanted to give another example before I move further. Uh, in 2002, there is this person called Eric. You know, he drank uh, to the fullest, okay, uh, up to the brim of his neck. And he started driving the car and hit a car which is coming in the opposite direction. And there are two girls in that car, okay. Uh, their names were like Megan and Lisa. They, they died on the spot. And obviously, he was taken to the trial and he's supposed to get 22 years of uh, pre imprisonment, okay. And uh, in the process, what happened? Well, he was in prison. He started reading the scripture portion. And at the same time, the two girls who, who were killed in that road accident, their parents were believers. I mean, good believers. They are okay to forgive this person. And they went ahead and told that we don't have any problem. We forgive the person who killed our daughters. It's not that simple, right? Probably we might bring to you another series on forgiveness. Maybe we are going to talk much about in that series. Particularly, these, these parents forgave this person who killed uh, uh, their, their daughters. You know, um, you should see that. It's, it's there all over in the, in, in the YouTube. Uh, but in the process, in, in, in the, while this trial is happening, Eric always had this problem. Even though he accepted Christ as his personal savior and repented, all his past particularly, sat an accuser constantly speaking to him uh, telling that, hey, you're a bad person. You killed those two people. You're not worthy to go and do the Lord's work, or you're not worthy to go and sit in the church. You should stay alone. You should not go anywhere. So he struggled with this for almost a year and a half, and later on embraced God's grace, and he did not let that bad choice or that thing happen in his life, uh, neither define him nor disqualify him. So particularly, we as believers, particularly uh, when, when we wanted to, we will have hard to serve may God or, or go into the, grow into the likeness of Christ. But, but if your bad choices or if your bad past is haunting you, you should learn to embrace God's grace. 
And we already know that and already Pastor Janet talked about that our God is a God who always gives second chances. That doesn't mean God is going to keep on giving you the second chances and you are, you, are, you are taking advantage of God. No, you are supposed to learn how to actually safeguard ourselves from these bad choices. Be responsible for your bad choices. Repent and turn away from your bad choices you made. Embrace God's grace. That's the first three things that you need to do in case you want to recover. And I'm sure all of us do. We want to make our lives better. We want it to see brighter. We want to get ahead. We want to have wonderful things ahead. Nobody wants to stay in a choice that you made and you're so stuck in it. So uh, be responsible for the choices you make. Repent, say sorry, go back to God and say, yes, I, I did what I did, but I want to move on. Can you help me to move on? And then you can embrace God's grace to help you to sail through. Now, we understood how you can recover, but we also need to understand and learn how can we safeguard ourselves from not making those bad choices again. Now, it's never going to be that you will never make a bad choice. You might. But it's better to know how to safeguard yourselves from making those kind of choices. Let's see. The first one, how can you safeguard yourself from making bad choices? Use God's word to guide you. We usually go to our, uh, our family or our loved ones or mentors or, 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 uh, or people that we think that know a little better than us. But just a heads up, in the kind of world that we live in, people are only looking for their advantage. People will only suggest, not, I'm, not, I'm not typecasting everybody, but most of the people. That's how, the, that's, that's how the world that we, are, we live in is. It will, they will guide you for their benefit. They will tell you for their benefit. I will praise Nani for my benefit. I will edify him for my benefit. I will guide him for my benefit. Because the fact is we do live in an eye world, don't we? We live in an eye world. And I want to do everything under the sun to make sure I guide him in the way that I would benefit from. But here it says, use God's word to guide you. You can go to any book. You can go to the biggest giant Google to guide you. But let me tell you something, that is constantly changing. The reviews change, the knowledge change, everything change, people change, time passes by. But this book has been, has been translating, will be translating four times to come till Christ come and it lives. It talks to you, it talks to me. I can still do an inky pinky ponky and it still will talk back to me. It will talk to me in my devotion, it will talk to me in my cry times, it will talk to me in my toughest decisions that I need to make, it will talk to me when I go back to it because it is the living word. And you cannot go wrong. You can't. Because even if you want to hear the decision that this living word wants to tell you, it will not. It will only tell you what God wants to tell you. No matter which page, no matter which favorite author, no matter which line, no matter which verse. He will still guide you in the way he wants to guide you. So this doesn't change. If you're 20, 40, 60, 80, it's still the same. This is something you can depend your life on. You will not go wrong with your choices. You cannot. 
So that's why go back to God's word to guide you, to avoid yourself from making bad choices. Wonderful verse. And this is something that we, you and me, need to practice. Psalm 119, 105. This is what it says. Your word is a lamp to my feet and the light to my path. It's not easy. It's definitely not. We don't like it. I don't like it sometimes. I hope it changes. But I hope and pray that each one of us, with the, even with the smallest choices that we need to make, we will make His Word the lamp unto our feet that will guide our ways so that our choices will be one of the best choices we make. And second point um, uh, on how to safeguard against making bad choices, you can write down in the notes that is given to you. Ask the Holy Spirit for wisdom. Turn your Bibles to John Gospel, chapter 16, verses 13. It says like this, But when He, the Holy Sp the, the, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth. And, and in the scripture portion, if you see, Holy Spirit is in you and with you. It's like as if you are holding a person. Wherever you go, He's in you and with you. So in, in this uh, 21st century, many a times we turn towards human wisdom or others' opinion or turn towards this greatest university called Google University and ask our questions, right? What should I do? Particularly, my wife, whenever she, particularly, she, 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 whenever she gets like headache or, or some, some uh, illness, she, she types in Google and finally, I, I, I prophesy already. See, by the, ultimately, you'll end up having cancer. Uh, so she, she'll be directed to various other sites like Quora or some, some webmd.com wherein you'll have all this medical stuff. And finally, she tells her, this scares me a lot, okay? So chances are in this, in, in this times, particularly, particularly in order to make any decision, I see particularly youth, millennials, uh, if you go through the core and read a lot of other questions, you'll see for, for simple choices that, that they are supposed to do, they, they put in Quora, what should I do? What should I do? So the generation has become in such a way that we are looking towards human wisdom or, or um, internet, computers, but as believers, we, we are supposed to seek the wisdom from Holy Spirit. We should lean on to Him. And whenever we make choices, we are supposed to ask these three questions, okay? Question number one, are my choices God-honoring? Are my choices God-honoring? Remember this, particularly believers, okay? Uh, many believers have this problem of recognizing um, whether this is from God or this is from me within, okay? Human voice or God's voice. Remember, Holy Spirit will never and ever contradict the Word of God. So you can always evaluate or authenticate with the Scripture portion. He'll never and ever do against anything against the Word of God. So your choices are God honoring or not. I told this because recent past I was having a conversation with one of my relatives who is into a bad relationship and started to defend himself by coming up with the scripture portions and telling that, hey, I have this voice. I told that, hey, whatever voice that you're hearing, it will not or never and ever contradict the word of God. If it is contradicting, then definitely that is not from the Holy Spirit. So both, first one, like reading the scripture portion and asking Holy Spirit, these two things are uh, uh, mostly interlinked. So it's question number two, how will this affect my spiritual health? We need to ask this question whenever we make a choice. Uh, coming to spiritual health, uh, um, I know that many of you are from science background. We all know that, right? We are three components, body, soul, and spirit. We believe that. And recent past, there is this um, doctor and author of the book called "Am uh, Am I Just My Brain?" Okay, am I I am just because of my, uh, it's all 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 of me is about my brain, or there is something uh, beyond my brain, like soul and spirit. So she j recently joined the team of RZIM, and she wrote a book, and she talks about uh, uh, there there are a lot of things beyond our brain, and there is this biggest question always in the science, like mind versus brain, right? 
So the, the, finally, the conclusions that they told, no, I realized it's already spoken uh, or, or written in the Word of God. These guys are, are debating about that, okay? We do believe that we have spirit and we need to take care of the spiritual health. And I want to tell about this, uh, I want to talk about this small example. Um, I, I love this person called Ravi Zacharias a lot. I watch his videos, I read his books, and um, I closely observe his ministries as well. Who is joining into the ministry, what is pro their profile, wherein they did their doctorate and all that stuff. And in one of his videos, he actually uh, uh, told this example. He normally sleeps or goes to bed at 9 p.m. And somewhere around 11 p.m., he got a call from one of his friends uh, who was a doctor. Okay, at the point in time, he called and told, Ravi, can you just pray for me? He told, what happened? And he told that somewhere around like 10 to 10.30, ambulance came to uh, our hospital, wherein they brought a woman who was around somewhere around 35 to 40 years old. She was beaten black and blue, and all, all her bones were crushed, okay, inside. And we wanted to, uh, their, her heartbeat got stopped, and we wanted to uh, make sure her heart actually starts back again and did all the medical stuff, but she's... Um, she's not recovered. I mean, her heart did not start beating. So that's why he actually put his right hand through the rib cage, uh, towards, through her left, uh, through the rib cage, and started giving that pump to the heart. And, but still, no matter how much he tried, uh, he couldn't save her. So after a period of time, uh, I mean a couple of minutes, this nurse came and told the doctor, I found all these needles and drugs in her uh, pocket, so probably she might be a drug addict. She, she's into a bad relationship. So do now doctor got this question, what if she's already contracted with HIV? And um, uh, in the process of actually saving her, when he was actually putting his hand in through the ribcage and pressing the heart, he had a paper cut on his ring finger. So as he had paper cut, and if she had contracted with HIV, there is a probability that he might also be contracted with HIV. And then that is why he called Ravi and asked, Ravi, can you pray for me? And Ravi was surprised and asked, didn't you tell that that's a paper cut? Yes, that's a paper cut. So a small paper cut can actually ruin your entire life. It can put you to death. So similarly, paper cuts to our spiritual life can also ruin our entire spiritual life. So we should be very careful with those paper cuts. Many a times we take God's word light, we take God for granted, uh, we take church for granted, and we, 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 uh, we, we, quench the, we will try to quench the spirit of God. If we don't take care of these proper paper cuts, there is a high probability that one day or the other, Spirit of God may leave you. I'm into the, I, I accepted Christ as my personal savior when I was 15 years old, uh, when I was studying my 10th standard. Now I'm 31. So all these 16 years, I saw a lot of people coming into the ministry, going to the ministry, and I saw people who did not take care of these paper cuts are gone. So whenever you make a choice, you should ask this question, how will this affect my spiritual health and third question that we are all supposed to ask when we are making uh, when when we are making choices is this how will this decision affect the people closest to me so when you ask these three questions and approach holy spirit for wisdom definitely he's in you and with you and he's going to guide you and uh, the decisions that you're going to make with the help of holy spirit is 100 percent going to bring glory to the name of god and blessing to all who are living around us and in our life so, so ask the Holy Spirit for wisdom. There is so much needed in our lives. And to check on our spiritual health, He is the only source of help that we can get. The last one. How do you safeguard yourself from bad choices? You use God's word to guide you. You ask the Holy Spirit for wisdom. And the last is you seek godly counsel. This is a very tough one, trust me. I don't know how about, how about you, but to go to somebody and ask for an advice, even for a, just a bit of advice, is difficult. That's the kind of life, that's the kind of the lifestyle that we live in. We think we know it all, at least that's what I'm assuming. We think we know it all, we do it all, we, we have done it all. Anyways, Google is there, the GPS is there. 
simple example, if I'm traveling and, and I, somebody sent me a route on the GPS and, and, and I'm going on the way and there's a roadblock and then I turn around and I'm still going and there's a roadblock, but I don't want to ask the guy who's on the road because I know it. I know the way. That's the simplest example that I can give you. That's the fact. Same with seeking godly counsel. It's very difficult because I'm already thinking, you and I am already thinking, I know it. It's up on the internet, it's up on the online, I see so many things, I read so many things. But let, you, let me tell you something that's so important in our lives. We need to surround ourselves with people who are better than us, who are wiser than us, who are smarter than us, and more spiritually sound than us. The ego doesn't play here. Always. They can never take you on a bad road. They can never um, uh, mean harm to you. They can never uh, tell you things that will not make a progress in you. But these are the wise people around you, your mentors or your wise counsel that will help you, encourage you, edify you, lift you up, walk with you in prayer when you, are, when you need help, hold up with you, cry with you, stay with you. And all your deepest, darkest secrets that only you know and God knows are safe with these people. They help you to become better. They help you to grow better. They be help you to become a better person in Christ. Surround yourself with people who are wise, spiritually sound, whom you, look, whom you can look up to. Seek godly counsel. There's nothing wrong in it. Because what the word speaks, so what will be the same thing what the Holy Spirit will nudge you, will be the same thing what these wise people will tell you. There won't be a bit of differentiation because it's just one spirit. All the three cannot go wrong. They're always the same. If you want to safeguard yourself this morning, go back to the Word. Use the Word to guide you. Ask the Holy Spirit for wisdom at the right time, at the right place. It's very important. Maybe you are an intellectual sitting here. But all of us, you and me, need wisdom at the right time to make the right choice. Have godly friends surrounding you to support you and lift you up. Beautiful lessons that we have learned from the life of Jonah. Just like Jonah, who received a second chance. Just like Jonah, whom God didn't disqualify, but he mentored just like Jonah, if we are in that situation, you are in that situation this morning, maybe you can just close your eyes and look back into your life. Maybe if there is a choice that you made that was wrong. Maybe if you, ma if you made a decision that was not right. Or maybe you are in a situation because of a bad choice. I really don't know how you have walked into this place this morning. But these are good lessons to learn from the life of Jonah. That God will help us to keep away from making bad decisions. I just would like you to bow down and Pastor Nani will pray. But I just want you to look into your lives, rewind yourself back. And if there is anything of this sort, give it up to the Lord. And say, Lord, I'm here this morning. I just want to say that I'm sorry for the bad choices I made. I am going to repent, but I want you to walk me through this. I don't want to be sitting here forever. A 
everybody is saying their own prayer for themselves. You can bow down your heads and pray.